anticipating the conclusion of uh, this cycle to get to 24 to see who is going to occupy the White House and the House of Congress. This is fundamentally a battle to shift covenants, to shift the balance of power, who will rule, which party will be seated in the place of dominance and influence. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. A covenant is an administrative mechanism. God has one kingdom, but he has varying administrative mechanisms. And those administrative mechanisms are called covenants. In those mechanisms by which he administers his kingdom rule through this covenantal connection is authorized by someone. We're told as Hebrews goes on in chapter 12 that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He manages, oversees this divine arrangement for how God is moving in this dispensation of his kingdom. So a covenant administers God's kingdom program in a particular era. Just like in politics, when a new administration takes over, some things continue and other things are changed. So it is in the new covenant. Some things transfer over, other things do not. And it is understanding that distinction, which Paul calls rightly dividing the word of truth, that helps us to appreciate, understand, and navigate how we're going to function in the arrangement that God is particularly operating under. And the arrangement that he is operating under is the lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the mediator of the new covenant. And as the mediator, he speaks. That's what verse 24 says, that he is the mediator of the new covenant, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Abel died, but Abel as a man dead still spoke because he was still alive. He was dead to earth, but alive to glory, but he spoke in glory and it influenced what God did on earth. Jesus is the mediator and a mediator brings together two parties. So Jesus is the mediator of the new arrangement that God is operating on today. And in fact, in this new arrangement, God's philosophy of history is that all things, Ephesians 1.10, will be summed up in Jesus Christ. And our goal is to get Jesus to talk. It says in the new covenant, Jesus speaks. And the beautiful thing about Jesus speaking is because he's both God and man, he can speak heaven and earth language. Because he's divine and human, he becomes the link between time and eternity. So the question is, if Jesus is speaking, how do I hear him talking? And how do I find out what he has to say? Since the new covenant allows him to speak, bringing heaven and linking it to history or going back to that concept of uh, how the spiritual realm links to the physical realm. Well, after identifying this principle of Jesus talking as the new covenant is administered, which we are part of as Christians and as the church of Jesus Christ, the question is, hearing God talk, hearing Jesus speaks. This leads the author of Hebrews to this well-known passage, still in Hebrews chapter 12. 
See to it, verse 25 says, that you do not refuse him who is speaking. So he's just talked about Jesus talking. He says, when Jesus is talking, don't turn him down. Don't refuse or reject the speech that is coming out of heaven and in history. He says, for if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape when we turn around from him who warns from heaven. So heaven is talking and it's talking to us in this new arrangement. How do I know when heaven is saying something to me, to us, or to our ministries? Verse 25, and his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. The expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. He says, God is talking. The way you know that he is speaking is he is disturbing the natural order of things. Let me say that again. You know that God is talking because the natural order of things are being disrupted or disturbed. It is when God shakes the natural order of things that Jesus has something fresh to say. A fresh word, a fresh statement. He has something that he wants to communicate. When this speech takes place and there is a disturbance that affects the earth, he says not only the earth, so it includes the earth, but it is more than the earth, it typically involves, because it's involving both, heaven and earth, a conflict between the two, between the physical and the spiritual, between the natural and the supernatural, not only the earth, but also the heavens as well. When Israel got to the Red Sea, they were in a contradiction. You got Pharaoh coming on one side and you've got water on the other side and they are stuck in between a contradiction tied to a command. They were supposed to flee, but how can I go and do what I was told to do when I got this coming here, I got that over there. So when you're put in a catch 22, it's because God has something new he wants to say. When God told Abraham to kill Isaac, that was full of contradictions. It was a biblical contradiction because God had already condemned murder. Yet God is telling Abraham to kill his son. It is a theological contradiction because he told Abraham through Isaac the nation would be blessed. But how is that possible if I'm killing Isaac? It is an emotional contradiction because it says that he was the son that Abraham loved. So he got to put his love aside in order to fulfill the will of God. It was a social, a, a social contradiction because how could he explain this to the society in which he lived? And it was certainly a familial contradiction because how is he going to explain to Sarah I'm getting ready to go kill our baby boy that we've been waiting all these years, me 100 and you 90, for us to have this baby boy in the first place, which explains why he got up early that morning to sacrifice him. He had to get up before she got up if he was going to pull this thing off. So, so it is a contradiction. It is, a, it is something that does not make sense that disrupts the natural order of things. That's how you know that the new covenant that's authored by Jesus that mediates between heaven and earth has something new to say. So when you're looking at COVID, 
When you're looking at the racial crisis, when you're looking at the political crisis, when you're looking at this disruption that has disrupted the whole world and even the ministry of the church, it's because God is talking. He has something to say out of the new covenant. Now, whenever something is disrupted, it is uncomfortable. The bad news is it doesn't feel good if your order, your life, your circumstances has been turned upside down. But most of you ladies here have had a baby, which means that you know what it is to be in labor. You know what it is to go through the pain of childbirth. But we all know that childbirth is bad news in a good situation. The bad news is that it hurts. The good situation is that you're creating, birthing something new. The joy of birth is not the pain of the disruption. The joy of birth is the result that comes from the pain of disruption. Or since in spite of what they're saying in some parts of the culture today, men don't get pregnant. The, the, we know what it is, most of us as men know what it is to throw up, to vomit, to regurgitate, okay? Well, that's usually bad news in a good situation because it's a nasty situation, but you usually feel better after you've done it. After you've thrown up, it, it, it's not good, but you feel better because you got out something that needed to get out. When God allows a disruption in the natural order of things, it's because he has something new he wants to say or wants to show or wants to communicate. We're living in a day of shaking. We're living in a day of disturbance. Martha and Mary ran into a contradiction. Jesus says, your, your brother is not going to die. He says, this is not under death. A few days later, He's dead. That's a contradiction. The sisters know it's a contradiction because both Martha and Mary say, said, if you would have been here, this would not have happened. In other words, Jesus is your fault because you weren't here when you said you were going to be here. Whenever God disappoints you or disturbs you, it's because he's speaking new information to you coming out of the shaking because there is a new covenant at new administrative manifestation he wants to bring to light to your life, to your environment, to your ministry, or in this case, what we're going through now is a disruption to the whole world. That's what's going to happen when the rapture takes place. There's going to be a disruption in the natural order of things. That's what's going to happen when Jesus returns to set his feet, not in the clouds, but on the earth. There's going to be a disruption in the natural order of things. Why? Because he's instituting something new. What we're going through is God wanting to do something different, to say something new, to, to communicate to you, me, and us that Business is changing. There is a new covenant strategy at work that God wants to implement. He says the danger is that you will refuse him who is speaking. Now, when there is a disruption in the weather, it's getting cloudy, it's getting stormy, or you take the hurricane that just hit Florida and worked itself up to South Carolina and up the East Coast, the one that got the most attention was the weatherman or the weather woman. You might normally look at them, but they got undivided attention when there was this hurricane disruption into the natural order thing, and you really wanted to hear what they had to say. Because this storm was going to turn your life upside down because there was going to be this meteorological interruption. What God is saying is, when the storm hits, in the circumstances of life, I want you to pay closer attention 
because I'm doing something and I'm saying something I really want you to hear. So in light of all we're going through in ministry, God is talking now. And maybe the tendency is to run out, to quit, to throw in the towel when God is saying, no, listen more closely because I've got some new information that I want to share with you. So he says, do not turn him down when he is speaking so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. So whenever there is a divine disruption, what God is seeking to do is shrink the physical and expand the spiritual. Let me say that again. Whenever there is the divine disruption, he is seeking to shrink the physical and he's seeking to expand the spiritual. You remember, some of you had grandmothers like my grandmother. We would go over to our house on the weekends in Baltimore, Maryland. And we would often spend the weekends with my grandmother. We would get some Baltimore crabs on Friday night. My grandfather would buy the crabs and uh, steam crabs. And we would, we would eat crabs. And, uh, and then we would get up and watch cartoons on Saturday morning. On one occasion, or more than one occasion, it began the thunder and lightning on Saturday morning. I remember one time it happened on my favorite cartoon, which was Mighty Mouse. <laughs> Here he comes to save the day, because <laughs> Mighty Mouse was on the way. And, I, and I, I love to see Super Mouse do his thing. On this particular day that I remember, it's this thunderstorm coming in. My grandmother said, Tony, turn the television off. <laughs> Say what? You heard me. Turn the television off. But I'm watching Mighty Mouse. Turn. Why do I have to turn the television off? She would say, because God is talking. <laughs> the thunderstorm meant that I had to shut stuff down because heaven wanted my undivided attention. Grandmother wasn't too far off because what God is saying is when I disturb the natural order of things, I want to bring to light the spiritual because the natural has claimed too much territory. What God has done in the culture, racially, class, politically, circumstantially, is saying, Y'all have gotten so secular. Y'all have gotten so world-oriented that I have been dumbed down too long for too much, so I'm going to turn this thing around. I'm going to disturb the natural order of things. This happened in um, Ezekiel chapter 43. Talk about politics. He told them, you have brought your kings too close to my throne. He says, you have brought your kings and put their throne in my temple next to my throne like we equal. So I'm going to disturb the natural order of things in Ezekiel chapter 43 to let you know, don't bring politics that close to me like we Siamese twins. And when you look at how the white church has become idolatrous Republicans, and the black churches become idolatrous Democrats. He said, I'm going to stir up the whole political order so you ain't going to know what you are because I'm going to confuse the whole thing until you understand there's only one king up in this house and I'm it. So when God disturbs the natural order of things, he is accentuating the spiritual he is dumbing down the physical in the sense of its illegitimacy in promoting that which is not reflecting my priorities my will and I've got to reshape some things so two things one of two things is happening today number one either Jesus is on the precipice of his of his return and he's allowing this disruption with the growth of technology to facilitate that 
intervention in the history known as the rapture of 1 Thessalonians 4, or it's not that he's returning, he's just resetting things so the church can become the church again and not just becoming a facilitator for the culture with a little Jesus sprinkled on top. Because when you look at the church today, it is increasingly abandoning God's truth to placate the culture. So God is shaking things up for us to have a radical return to his truth and his standard so that his will, his way, and his word becomes the dominant influence and not just merely one of another word that the culture gets to hear. He says it is God talking and he wants undivided attention. So the question then is, what is supposed to be happening since God is talking? And how am I going to pick up on the signal for myself, for my ministry, or how he wants to use us in the world in which we live? He keeps going in verse 28 of Hebrews chapter 12. He says, therefore, whenever you see therefore, you want to ask what it's there for. Therefore always links to what he's just said. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Ah, the word shaken is used again. When we saw shaken a moment ago, it was God disturbing something, turning things inside out. He uses the word unshaken. It cannot be shaken. So we're back to my word again. Kingdom. Okay? All right? Since we have a kingdom, the Greek word for kingdom is basilia. It means rule or authority. It is the rule of God. God's rule is comprehended, comprehensive. It's administered covenantally. It's administered according to a regime over which Jesus is over now. And Jesus is now the one talking on behalf of God. He's talking about the kingdom. The kingdom that we have received that cannot be shaken. In other words, it is a kingdom that is not subject to the culture. Let me say that again. The culture is disturbed because God is talking. But God is talking in a disturbed culture to talk about a kingdom that cannot be disturbed. So he's talking about the rule and reign of God in the midst of the chaos of culture. So in the midst of all this craziness that's going on, there should be one place that is not budging when everything else is shifting. There should be one place that's stable when everything else is changing. So if you are losing your stability, I am losing my stability. That means we're too culturally attached. And because he does not want us culturally attached, he will let us get as disturbed as the culture is until we return to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So if we all shook up, like everybody else is all shook up, we're too attached. Since we're too attached, he's going to let us get shook up like they're shook up until we get reattached because he wants to reveal a kingdom, a rule that cannot be shaken or disturbed by what is happening around us. If you're in an airplane and there's, you, you notice how orderly things look in the plane? I mean, the, 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 the farmland is all squared and the, the, the highways are all in order and everything looks so peaceful when you're flying in a plane. Once you hit the ground, you hit the chaos. Up in the plane, you see the order. And the reason is because you're looking at it from a different perspective. You're looking at it from up there and not down here. Too much God's church is looking at things down here to determine what they're going to do and who they're going to be rather than things from up there 
to determine how things are going to stay. I love the story of Joshua fitting the battle of Jericho. Joshua fitting the battle of Jericho and then the two, the two spies go into the red light district and they run into Rahab. Rahab says, now, I didn't heard about your God and I believe in your God. She receives the spies. We're told that not only did she receive the spies, but she sent them out another way. And she lied about it because she told the people at the door, I don't know who they are. I haven't seen them. She sends them out another way. The two spies say to her, when we come back and shut this mama down, when we come down and bring Jericho to its collapse, bring all of your kinfolk into your house. And when this Jericho collapses, because of what you've done, you and your family will be spared. So when you ever preach the story of Joshua fitting the battle of Jericho, don't make all the wall come down. Because the Bible says Rahab's house was embedded in the wall. So her house was attached to the wall. So when the walls of Jericho fell down, there was a piece of the wall still standing because her house was attached to it. Her house was attached to a piece of the wall that was not going to be subject to the rest of the wall because it was operating under a different realm, under a different authority, so it was not subject. Your church and my church should not be subject to all this craziness happening in the culture. It shouldn't be subject to the redefinition of marriage. It shouldn't be subject to the redefinition of gender. It shouldn't be subject to the divisiveness of race. It shouldn't be subject to the divisiveness of politics or class or culture. Why? Because we're attached to a whole nother wall that does not shake. It does not move. It does not budge. It's operating on a whole different, shall I dare say this word, kingdom agenda. It's operating on a whole different program of God. And therefore, it's not subject. But because we've gotten so attached to the wrong wall, when the wrong walls fall, we fall with it because we're not attached to the promise wall where Jesus is saying, this is an unshakable location. It does not move with the culture because we're not listening to the right word. What God is saying to the church today is I want you to act on the kingdom you have received. Since we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Guess what he goes on to say? He says this is the time for ministry to go to a whole new level. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer God an acceptable service. He says, this is not a time when I'm talking and shutting everything up and flipping everything over for you to run. This is a time for you to take ministry to the next level. In fact, he not only says take ministry to the next level, he says, I want you to take it to the next level with a smile. He says, take it with gratitude. He wants you to be grateful. You're not grateful in labor for the pain. You're grateful for the baby. So he's not saying be grateful for the inconvenience. He's saying be grateful for the opportunity. Because in the middle of this madness, I'm going to show you what an unshakable situation looks like. But you can't be listening to the wrong voice. Fort Worth is 30 miles and 30 minutes from here. On one occasion, I was asked to go to Fort Worth to speak in the evening. Got in my car, and it was before all this computer stuff and fancy stuff and GPS stuff. They faxed the direction to me, to Sylvia, and Sylvia printed it and gave it to me. So I had uh, the word from the pastor giving me the directions for where I was to go to get to his church 30 minutes from here in Fort Worth. So I read the directions, and I went down 20, then I was to get on 820. Then I saw the exit. I got off the exit. I turned left to begin to make my way to the church. 
I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving, but I'm not seeing the church. Now I'm in the country. I'm in the country. If there's a church out here, Dr. Doolittle is the pastor. Because I'm not seeing anything but horses and cows and sheep and goats. I am in the country. So now I'm a little confused. I'm supposed to speak at seven. It's 10 of seven and I can't find the church. So I turn around and make my way back the other day, other way, and I pull over to a 7-Eleven and ask them, do you know where this church is? He tells me, well, yes, you go down two blocks and turn left again. Thank you. I went two blocks, turned left, but now I'm in a residential district. There's nothing but houses in here. I hit a cul-de-sac, so there's no place further for me to go. I back up and turn around, come back out, go to the next light. Another person pulls up to me. I turn down my window, wave them to turn down their window. Do you know where this church is? They gave me another direction. I went there and there was no church. Now it's seven o'clock, so now I'm late. I decide to pick up the paper from the pastor. I started off with the word, but then when I hit the exit, I turned left, leaning to my own understanding. Then I started talking to folk who I thought should know something and they led me further astray. I decided to pick up the paper from the pastor because the pastor should know where his church is located. I picked it up and I saw what happened. I read two thirds of the word, but the last third of the word I didn't pay attention to. It said, when you get to the bottom of the exit, turn right. I turned left. When I went back and retraced and turned right, the church was one block from the exit. I went all around the mulberry bush because I was not letting the author tell me which way to go. I didn't pay attention to the writer of the directions. When a chaos starts happening, you want to look for two things. What has God said in his written word and what is he saying in his circumstantial operation when he's shaking things, disturbing things? The written word is like a, it's like a, a, a rule book in a football game. It's a rule book in a football game, and that's the standard for everybody who plays football. But then there, every team has their own playbook. Their playbook is different, and the playbook is unique to each team. And within the playbook, there are audibles called by the quarterback. The quarterback may go up to the line of scrimmage and change this play on the spot because he sees the defense lining up in a way he did not pre-anticipate. None of the things in the rule book changes, but things regularly change in the playbook or on the field depending on what's happening at the moment. The Bible is the rule book. So that gives the standard for everybody because it's the rule book. But God is regularly shifting the playbook and sometimes he audibilizes the call on the spare of the moment. So if you're not paying attention, you may know the rule book but not know the playbook. The reason God gives us the Holy Spirit is so that he can within the rule book of the word give us the playbook of our action. And sometimes he audibilizes it on the spot so that you have to make a quick turn and a quick change because of what Satan or the world or the culture is doing. It's amazing how many pastors don't change their sermons when the world is disrupted by a situation that happens in Minnesota when a man is killed by a policeman and they just preach in their series like nothing happened because the Holy Spirit doesn't have the freedom to call an audible in the series because they're not in tune to the shaking that has occurred in the culture so that God's 
playbook can be communicated to God's people. Blue rule book can be complete, communicated to God's people because the pastor has gotten the playbook or the audible that's needed for the disturbance that has occurred. He says, I want you to give an unshakable answer to what's happening in the culture when things are falling apart. So my challenge to you today is to not to look at the inconveniences we are all experiencing as a distress, but as a communication device. God is saying he wants us in a different way, at a different level, based on the object of truth of the word to the subject reality of its application in the experience of the ministry we perform to demonstrate that while everything else is sh shaken, we're not shaken. You know, uh, when they are, are, when you iron your clothes, you're disturbing the natural order of things. Things are wrinkled and you're putting fire on it. If the shirt or blouse could talk, they would say, it's hot up in here. They would say, you're burning me up. The closing, ver closing line of that verse says, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, when a sacrifice was consumed on the altar, that was bad news and good news. It was bad news for the animal, but good news for the people. When the animal was put on the altar, the bad news is it had to die and give up his life. But it meant the forgiveness of sins for the people. So the bad news was good news happening at the very same time. For the animal bad, for the people good. Our God is a consuming fire. When you put that iron on the shirt or the blouse, guess what it's doing? It's consuming wrinkles. It's consuming things that need to be changed. It's consuming things that are wrong that need to be made right. And why do you put that hot iron on that blouse or shirt? Because you want to straighten something out. Something that's not straight needs to be made straight, but you got to create some heated inconvenience for it to get straight or else it'll just look bad and be wrinkled. Right now, God has a hot iron on the church. That's because it's too wrinkled. That's because it's been hanging out in the culture too long and is not representing the unshakable level of the kingdom. So I agree with you. It is hot up in here if we're trying to do ministry. But you know why you iron that blouse or you iron that shirt? Because you're going to wear it. You're going to put it on and you're going to want to look good in it. You know why God is allowing the chaos in the culture to show his un unshakable kingdom? Because he wants to wear us and he wants to look good in us. But he got to get the wrinkles out of us first so that when he puts on Jesus Christ and he puts on the kingdom garb that his kingdom people looking good and not walking around or ministering with wrinkled uh, circumstances and wrinkled ministry because they're shaking like the culture. God is talking and he's got some good news. He wants you to reattach to the un-